good morning students good morning sir okay so now 1105 so i am starting the class i can see 15 students have joined that's fine okay uh now to start with uh, in my last class i have tried to explain the fdm formulations for two dimensional system with equal nodal distances but uh, i was also trying to tell you that if i use these equal nodal distances then to keep that basic assumption valid that means is it what's no, up we can hear you uh, Okay, I'll speak slowly so that it will be probably uh, there will not be big issue. Uh, okay, let me do one thing. Let me put off my video. Okay, that will not help. Okay, now uh, what I am telling is that in my last class I was. explaining how to write a dim equation in two dimensional system with equal nodal distances but i told you that there are some basic assumptions one of which is uh, we assume a potential distribution between two successive nodes now the most common or normal assumption is linear linear potential distribution but uh, you can always argue that how do you know it is linear the answer is i do not know but i know that if something is non linear for example if a curve line is taken then if i subdivide that curve line into small small segments then one small segment can be taken as linear or straight line so same approach we will do that we will take the internal nodal distances to be very small so our basic assumption remains or holds good but in that case what will happen is uh if the system is a complicated fractal system the number of nodes will increase significantly because the internal nodal distances are less so then we have to find a practical compromise the how we do it for that in my last class i have already explained but still i again repeat so i share a figure here probably now you can uh, you can see probably that is it coming now yeah good so now you can see that uh, it's a very simple system that three transmission line conductors air as insulation and now if this is the one that i take then if i take equal nodal distances the number of nodes will become very high so i have to take unequal nodal distances but to how to do it that means the question is where do i take smaller nodal distances and what do i take larger nodal distances for that we use our knowledge of field distribution typically near the electrode the field very sharply that means it is non linear so we take smaller internal nodal distances as we move away from the electrode the field variation becomes 
not so sharp that means it very slowly so we take larger internodal distances so this is an example shown and therefore for practical systems we have to do this practical compromise that we take unequal nodal distances but if that is the case then our derivation that we have done that has to be changed but how do we change it if we take all the nodal distances different different the equations becomes highly complicated so we don't do that we take a different approach what we do is very interesting or the approach proposed is very interesting that take the whole take the whole system uh, so let me again show you uh, here so this is the whole system i have discretized and first we do is we search for the largest internodal distance let's say that is a so logically all other internodal distances are less than a so what we do we represent all other internodal distances as a fraction of a let us say fraction s where s is a dimensionless quantity between 0 and 1 so we say the internodal distances are s h this is the approach we take so now i go to the today's discussion that how i develop the in uh, Now it should be able to see. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So now we are taking the unequal internodal distances. So now here is the configuration. This is just this curved line is just showing some sort of a boundary or whatever. So don't bother about the curve line. Look at the uh, node nodes. So here our target node is node zero, and it is connected to four other nodes similar to our last class. But the difference is, you can see the distance between zero and one. Now it is written as s one into h, where s one is a dimensionless quantity. the distance between 0 and 2 is written as s2 into h similarly s3 into h and s4 into h where h is the largest internodal distance in the entire system so with this if we apply the taylor series between 0 and 1 so whatever approach that we you know Did in our last class, so we follow the same approach. So V one, that is x plus a, y plus b, where a is s one h and b is zero, as you can see here. So we write equation eighty. Then we write between zero and three. Where x plus a and y plus b, then a becomes minus s three h and b is zero. So we write equation nineteen. And then what we did in our last class in the same way we eliminate del v del x because I want the term del v del x square at the node zero because that is the term of Laplace equation. Now this is an algebra which I am not going into the details. You can do it, but I have shown it here. That is equation twenty, which is the expression for delta v del x square. 
Then we follow the same approach and we write del 2 v del y square equation 21. And then we write Laplace's equation at the node 0 and we substitute equation 20 and equation 21 here. And then we rearrange and we arrive at equation 22. Now this is a very interesting equation. Why? Because if you see here, this equation involves potentials, node potentials, and S1, S2, etc., which are dimensionless quantities. So therefore it's a scalar equation. And also it's a, you know, what is called a linear equation. So even in this case also, ultimately we have arrived at a linear equation involving scalar quantities only. That is always the target approach of this system, of this FDM. Now you can ask how do I apply this. For that I have given this example. Now this is a half circle, although the drawing is not good. Let's say potential is 100. And by the way, one thing I have to tell you that I am saying this is a two-dimensional system. So this half circle, what is its actual shape in real life? That is something you have to visualize. I said that in a two-dimensional system, the field varies only on the xy plane, does not vary in the z plane. So it is like if I translate the whole system in the z direction, system will remain same, there will be no variation in field. Now, when I translate these along the z axis, so if you translate this half circle along the z axis, what you get is a half cylinder. Therefore, please remember that this is nothing, this configuration which I am showing on your screen is nothing but a half cylinder and R. Now here, I have given certain nodes where node 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are the nodes having unknown node potential. As I said that some boundary node potential has to be known. So this fictitious boundary, I have assumed some node potentials, but don't bother about that. This is not a practical case. It's just an assume. And then there is one nodal, all other nodal distances being equal, but for node 3, in the positive direction of Y, there is a node on the electrode for which the internodal distances are less than 8. So, it is given that let's assume that S2 is 0.5, while all other will be H, which means all other values of S will be 1 and S2 will be 0.5. By the way, I have forgotten to tell you that if you take equation 22 and if I put S1, S2, S3 and S4 all equal, what you get? What sort of system you get? I put S1, S2, S3, S4 as 1. What sort of system you get? Sir, a system with equal uh, nodal distances. Absolutely correct. So, mm -hmm. you get equal. So, therefore, if you do that, you must get the same expression which we have discussed in the last class. So, please check this one whether you are getting the same expression or so in this example which you are seeing on your screen we here i am assuming half symmetry because we always try to take the advantage of symmetry because that reduces the system size now since this vertical line at the middle the right side and the left side are identical so what we are doing, we are assuming only half symmetry. So if you look at node 1, only three nodes are connected. 
but our derivation is always based on four nodes. So along the x-axis, only one node is connected, that is four, which will be our node one as per derivation. So what will be the node three as per derivation? Can you suggest? Look at the direct figure, node one, three nodes are connected. Along y direction, you have two nodes, but along x direction, you have only node four, which as per our derivation is node one. Then there is a second node, node three, along x direction. But here, which one is node three as per derivation? And remember, this has half symmetry. Can you suggest which one is the missing node? Here, somewhere here, you can see my mouse moving. If you take the half symmetry, this answer is very simple. It will be exactly the same as O, because right side and left side is symmetrical. So we will take another node on the left side and assume that that potential is equal to 4. Similarly, for node 5, we will assume another node on the left side and we'll assume it is potentially equal to 5. So that's exactly what we have done here. You see, V1 is written. Uh, 2v4 has come. Why 2v4 for v1? Because v4 on the right side and v4 on the left side. On the top is 100, on the bottom is v2. So you see here v1, 2v4, v2, and 100 by 4, that is 25. Similarly, V2 on the top V1 on the bottom is 0, then 2V5. So you can see 2V5 plus V1 and then of course 0 by 4. Similarly, for V3, it is equal nodal distances. By the way, 1, 2, 4, 5, they are all equal nodal distance. Only V3 has an equal nodal distance. So if I take V4, so I use the equal nodal distance equation. Then if I take V5, I use the equal nodal distance equation. Only for V3, I use the unequal nodal equation. But looking at the configuration, as for our derivation, for node 3, S1, S3, and S4 are 1. Because they are all H. Only S2 is 0.5. So you can see here S1, S2, S3, these are all 1. S2 is 0.5, and therefore this is how V3 I write as per this equation 22. So if such problems are given, you have to write the equation using this app. Now, if I take the three-dimensional system with equal nodal distance, well, that's pretty simple. Our approach remains same that in this case, the subdivision will not be square, but it will be U. So every target node will be connected to six nodes, not four. And following the convention that we have used for two dimensional cases, one and three will be the nodes in x direction, two and four will be the nodes in y direction, five and six will be the node in the z direction. And therefore, if you approach, I mean, apply the same Taylor series for two dimensional cases here, but now you have to apply three times, x, y, and z direction. So you get three terms, delta V del x squared, delta V del y squared, delta V del z squared. And then you arrive at equation D6. That is the FDM equation for uh, three-dimensional system with unequal nodal distances. And following the same approach, that is, this one, whatever we have done, how we develop this equation for uh, two-dimensional system with unequal nodal distance, we can do the same thing for three-dimensional system with unequal nodal distances. In that case, 
will have S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, and S6. There will be six dimensionless quantities involved in the equation. But I have not derived it. This is uh, your assignment. So I will send it today that you have to derive it and send it to me after one week. So that will be one assignment. Now I come to something um, very interesting. What I have to do now is I have to now stop sharing this. I should share another file now. Okay, now I have opened it. So I will share now. So hopefully it will come on your screen. Now can you see something? Yes, sir. Okay, so now I will try to explain what is called axisymmetric configuration. This is not a two-dimensional configuration in general terms. That means here we are representing the system in the cylindrical coordinate system, not in Cartesian. Now, just to recall cylindrical coordinate system, typically what we do in this case, we don't say it is the origin, but we say it is pole. But it is the same as the origin, but terminology is different. And then x-axis is called the polar axis, and the orthogonal axis is called y, same. And on this polar plane, uh, this angle theta is taken from the polar axis in the anti-clockwise direction. And the axis which is perpendicular to the polar plane is the z axis. So any point P, as you can see here, what is its coordinate? In Cartesian, it will be x, y, and z. But in the cylindrical coordinates, we first take the projection of the point P on the polar plane. Then this radial distance from the pole is called R. That is one axis, uh, sorry, one coordinate. Then the angle theta that this R makes with the polar axis is the second coordinate. And the vertical distance that is Z is the third coordinate. So the coordinates are R, theta, and Z. Now, you are quite conversant with this R and theta and X and Y because you have done this extensively in your electrical engineering. That is, you must have used that uh, polar to rectangular and rectangular to polar, all those sort of conversion that comes only with a two-dimensional. That means either you take the xy plane or the polar plane. Then it is xy, which is rectangular coordinate, and r theta, which is the polar plane. And if we go for the three-dimensional, then we have this Cartesian. Uh, X, Y, Z, or the cylindrical R, Z. Now, this is very, very convenient in electrical engineering. For example, on the right side, you see a figure. Can you identify what is this? Which object is this one? Disk insulator. Right. So, this is a disk insulator. But this is not the entire insulator. What is it? It's a cross section. That too, not the entire cross section. It's only half of the cross section. Now, uh, you see, how do we generate geometries? This is very interesting. For example, if you take a point here, as you can see my mouth, and if I translate this point along the x-axis, I get a straight line. So a line is obtained by translating a point. 
and if this translation is not along a straight line, you get a curved line. Now, if this straight line is translated vertically, I'm going to get an area. Or if I rotate this straight line along the axis, I'm going to get an area. And once I get an area, now this cross section is an area. If I rotate this cross section 360 degree around the axis, I am going to get the volume. So this is how actually in computers all the geometries are generated by proper mathematical operations. Now here, what we are taking the advantage of that, that if I take this half cross section, as I can see, and this Z axis is the axis of the entire object, and we are rotating it by 360. Now, interestingly, if you see that, if, if you consider this on disk, now here it is cut at say theta is equal to zero degree. If you consider the disk and if you cut it at theta is equal to 90 degree by a vertical plane, will be will there be any change in the cross section? I repeat, this is the this is the uh, disk insulator cut by a vertical plane at theta is equal to zero degree. If I cut it at theta is equal to 90 degree by a vertical plane. Will there be any change on the cross-sectional plane? No, sir. No, correct. So therefore, we'll see always the same configuration. That means same high voltage electrode, same earth electrode, same porcelain, etc. So therefore, if I take any point on this RZ plane, of course, the potential will vary with R and Z because the point, point is varying with respect to the entire system. But for any given point, if I consider this point to be at two different theta, I don't find that the system or the configuration is changed. It remains the same. Or I can say that with respect to theta, it is symmetric. So the field will not vary with theta. Field will vary only with R and Z. Therefore, can I now say that this is also a two-dimensional system because field is varying along two coordinates, not three coordinates. Interestingly, if you represent this system in Cartesian, then you cannot prove it. There it will vary with x, y, and z, all three. So it will remain three-dimensional in Cartesian. Moment I represent it in cylindrical system, then I can show or prove that it is not varying with theta. It is varying with R and Z. So therefore, this is called axisymmetric configuration, and we consider it as a two-dimensional system only when represented in cylindrical coordinates. Now you can ask me, fine, what are the examples? I will show you now because that will clear your conception. This is our high voltage lab. If you visit, you will see that we have a high voltage capacity. This is a 250 kV capacity along with a transformer. This vertical one is the capacity. Now, if you look at it, and then if you imagine that if I cut this vertical capacitor by a vertical plane at different different theta, the configuration remains same, isn't it? So it's an axisymmetric system. Now, you can see on your screen a high voltage string insulator. You can see here the string insulator. Again, just imagine that this string insulator, and you can cut it by a vertical plane at different different theta, your cross-sectional plane remains same. So it's an axisymmetric system. You take the high voltage pin and post insulator. The left side is the pin insulator, right side is the post type insulator. 
again, if you cut it by vertical plane, then you can clearly see that the cross-sectional plane configuration remains same for both the type. So they are axisymmetric system. And very important example is this one. This is a power transformer where this cylindrical big object you can see is the conservator. Can you tell me what is this three objects that is coming out from the transformer? Here you can see my mouse moving. What is it called? Bushings. Bushings. Perfectly correct. Now this bushing again, if you look at it, and if you cut it by a vertical plane at different theta, is it not axisymmetric? It is axisymmetric. So that's another example of axisymmetric system. And this is so important. It's a bushing of a power transformer is very important object. This is a circuit breaker, very high voltage circuit breaker. And you can see this horizontal cylindrical object is actually the circuit breaker. And these are again the circuit breaker bushings. Earlier you have seen the transformer bushings. This is the circuit breaker bushing. And you can see there are three uh, poles, we call it RYB. You can see here horizontally RYB. They are the three circuit breakers. And there are always two bushings. Why? Because circuit breaker will have one incomer and will have, will have the outcome. So incomer and outgoing. So, but then looking at this bushing, again you can see that it is an axisymmetric system. Therefore, I'm what I'm trying to hit you is that there are a number of practical objects which are axisymmetric. This is a high voltage isolator. You know that circuit breakers are never used without an isolator. Circuit breakers always have one isolator uh, before it and one isolator after it. Now, this isolator, and if you see this vertical of one, is it not axisymmetric? Very clearly, it is axisymmetric. This is CT and ET. Now, this is actually a, a photograph from uh, an actual uh, substation, and you can see ROIP, you can clearly see from the colors. Now, looking at this, sometimes I always ask this question that uh, how do you know which one is CT and which one is PT? It is all looking same. There is a way to look at it. Just look at the blue color here. You can see this one. If you see my mouse moving, the blue color. You can see this object at the top. One wire is going in and one wire is going out. This is CT because CT is in series with the line. So this is typically series. Whereas PT is in parallel with the line. So this vertical one, the blue one, you can see there is no wire going in and going out. The wire is going from the top and PT is connected in parallel. Otherwise, it is very difficult to identify CT and PT. You have to understand the connection, the parallel and series connection. And now going from this, this vertical one, blue, if you see, again, it's a PT bushing and then CT also, you can see the CT. It's not bushing, it's an insulator. But they are axisymmetric. You can clearly see they are axisymmetric. This is a lighting arrester. Transformer light with lighting arrester. Here you can see transformer. Here you can see the transformer bushing on top. And then transformer bushing, you can see the connection coming. This is the lighting arrester. Here you can see in the second one. Here you can see connection coming to lighting arrestor, then going to the transmission line. And by the way, this is a very interesting uh, arrangement. Can you see this transformer does not have three bushings? Only two bushings, one on this side, one on the other side. Can you guess what is, why is it so? Why not three bushings? 
So we are not able to see the image. Huh? You are not able to see? So it has paused. Slide has paused. Stop presenting. Oh my God. When which slide it has paused? So now nothing is visible. Blank. So now, now it is. No, let me see. Is it coming now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, but tell me which one you could see. This one you have seen? Yes, yes sir. This one you have seen? Yes, sir. This one you have seen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This one? Yes, sir. This one? Yes, sir. This one? Yes, sir. This one? Yes, sir. yes, sir. So only this one you have not seen. Fine. Uh, now, again, what I was telling, you can see this is a transformer with lightning edge. Uh, you can clearly see the transformer bushing, the vertical one on top of the transformer. And particularly the second one, you can clearly see the bushing is connected by this wire to the lightning register, this vertical one. And then the connection goes to the transmission line. So lightning arrester is in between the transmission line and the transformer. This is connected in parallel. That is the typical connection. What I was asking is this transformer is only having two bushings, one in the front, one on the back, not three bushings. Can you guess why is it so? The single phase transformer. Correct. But then why are we using single phase transformer? Sir, because there are many advantages. Only one transformer we have to keep keep in standby. Ah, uh, correct. So now this is called a transformer bank. Right? You can clearly see in this photograph there are three transformers. Is it one, then middle one, then and the far end the third one. So, so three single phase transformers are connected externally into star and delta, not internally. And there we have a lot of advantages, as you rightly pointed out. But this is actually a bank transformer, transformer bank. If you have not seen it, this is exactly a transformer bank. And therefore, it has only two bushings. But you can see the lightning arrester, what I was telling. You can see, if you can see my mouse moving, this is the lightning arrester. It's an axisymmetric system. Another very interesting one, I just passingly I will mention, between the two transformers, there is a vertical wall. Can you tell me why? See, all the three transformers are separated by a vertical wall. What is the reason? Maybe to eliminate resonance due to the humming sound. No, no, no. Not so complicated, very simple. This is if there is any accident or anything in one transformer, it will not directly hit the other one. Right? This is a concrete one, so that will protect. So, this is very plain and simple logic. And another one you can see, you can see here if you can see my mouse, L type a rod. Can you see it here? Here, yes, sir. What is it? Can you guess? Breather. No, no, no. These are not breather. These are called sprinklers. This is fire extinguisher. For these transformers, because they are very expensive, we put fire extinguisher so that it's all automatic. If there is any sort of fire, these will be started and then this will sprinkle fire extinguisher, whatever it is, you know, water or whatever. So we uh, this entire system is very, very well designed and well thought of. And finally, I will show you, uh, which probably you have, you will see, it is called a capacity voltage transformer. We call it CVT. And this bottom one here, you can see the yellow line. Bottom one is actually the CVT, and this one is the high voltage capacitor of the CVT, the vertical one. It's a very high voltage one. That's why, but this is again accessible. This is so interesting, right? 
and on the left side you can see the uh, cylindrical objects three objects can you see on the left side uh, you have any idea what are these three these are not ct or pts these are connected in parallel also you can see on the transmission line is on the top not transmission line the bus bars these are on the top you can see three bus bars here these wires are actually the bus bars and these cylinders are connected or dropping down from the bus bar. These are called the wave traps. Wave traps, these are used for carrier communication. Uh, probably you will uh, study it in your switchgear. Uh, you have switchgear class? Yes, sir. So this carrier communication will be in the switchgear class. This is, these are the wave traps. These are basically a parallel resonance circuit. L and C parallel resonance circuit, but operating at the full uh, high voltage. But again, I am talking about the CVT. You can see this is an axisymmetric system. So what I would try to show you is so many practical cases where I have the uh, axisymmetric system. So quite obviously, I will have to derive the axisymmetric configuration or the FPM equation. So how do I do it? So I go to the axisymmetric system with equal nodal distance. And this is what I have already explained. But the first thing is equation 24, that the Laplace's equation have to be changed. It should be represented in R theta and Z, not in X, Y, Z. Now that, that can be done. So that is in equation 24. By the way, I have a question to you. Have you studied all the coordinate systems in detail? Yes, sir. OK. Spherical, cylindrical, and Cartesian. OK, good. Then it is all right. Now, when we are saying that it's an axisymmetric system, we are saying it is independent of theta. So the third term of equation 24 is 0, we get equation 25. So you can see that compared to the Cartesian, I get one more term here. In Cartesian, it was only the second order derivatives. Here it is also a first order derivative of del v del r. Anyway, now this is the system, again, same as that of the two-dimensional differences. We don't write x and y, we write r and z. So here also target node 0, then 1, 2, 3, 4. All nodal distances are h. But there is only one distance. Here the z-axis is the axis of symmetry, and it is part of the system. And the distance from the axis is an important term. So what we do, that radial distance r from the z-axis, which is axis of symmetry, is also represented in terms of h. That means 1H, 2H, 3H, etc. Again, same way, we write the Taylor series between 0 and 1. The approach is same for all the derivations. Then we write between 3 and 0. So we have equation 26 and 27. And in this equation, I have 25. I need del to be del R square one term. I need del V del R. So I use equation 26 and 27. First, I eliminate del V del R. I get del to V del R square. Then I eliminate del to V del R square. I get del V del R. So this is the del to V del R square algebra you do. I am not going into that. Del to V del R square equation 28. And then del V del R. The interesting part is in the... Uh, in the equation 25, this del v del r is having a term 1 by r. What is r? r is the radial distance from the axis. Now, therefore, r is written as s into h, where s is a numeric, again, dimensionless number. But this is not between 0 and 1. This could be anything, because it is distance from the axis in terms of h. So in this way, I can have 1 by r del v del r. Then similarly, I have del to v del z square, putting everything together and satisfying the Laplace's equation. We can see this is equation 30. It's called the FDM equation for axisymmetric system with equal nodal distance. 
Here again, you can see this involves only scalar quantities, that is potential, and S is a dimensionless quantity. So it's a linear equation involving scalar Problem is, in this equation 30, I have a problem. What is that? That is this S. Why? Because I said that this axis Z is also within my region of interest. This is not outside because this is the axis of the, let's say, the insulator. It's not outside the insulator. So one target node will also be on the axis. If that is the case, then what is my radial distance? That is zero. Now, if R is zero, then this second term becomes undefined. Then what to do? So what we have to do is we go into slightly other aspect. That if this node is on the axis, then it looks like this. Target node zero on the axis. By the way, this is not half symmetry. This is the rotational symmetry. So there is no symmetric node on the left side this is on it will be only connected to three nodes and for the node zero s is equal to zero but here we are applying our knowledge that see if you think about the flux lines the flux lines they will be on this rz plane and since it is rotationally symmetric the flux lines will not cross this axis of symmetry because then the symmetry will be lost. So all the flux lines, whatever it is, will be on this, this RZ, this plane, so that when we rotate it 360 degree, I get the entire volume as including the flux line. So flux lines can be of any shape, but it will not cross this axis of symmetry. Or conversely, if I ask, then Along the axis, what will be the direction of flux line? There could be only one solution that it should be tangential to the axis. That means it will be vertical. Now, flux line is actually nothing but the resultant of the components of first order derivative of potential. That is the electric field intensity. If it is tangential to the z axis, then del V del R is zero. Mathematically speaking, we represent it as that del V del R tends to zero as R tends to zero in axisymmetric system. If that is the case, then we have an interesting application of La Hospital's rule. We know that limit R tends to zero, one by R del V del R, this becomes del V del R square, provided that del V del R tends to zero when R tends to zero. And therefore, in our system, this is true. So the, this we apply. And then Laplace's equation is modified. That means the second term, 1 by R del V del R, becomes del to V del R square. So we get equation 31, where 2 del to V del R square. But this is for a node on the axis, not for other nodes. Fine. If that is the case, then we apply Taylor series between 0 and 1. I get here this one. But del V del R at 0 is 0. So second term becomes 0. Straight away I get del 2 V del R square. And I apply Taylor series between 0 and 2, 0 and 4. I get del 2 V del Z square. And then I put that in the equation. And I get equation 34, which is actually the uh, equation for a node on the axis of symmetry. To just understand how we apply the equation, I have given a problem. This is an axisymmetric problem, so it is not half symmetry. So the nodes one and two, which are on the axis, they are very much within the system, and there is no left hand side as symmetry. It's a rotational symmetry. So the boundaries are on the top, on the right, and on the bottom. These are the assumed potentials. Again, I'm saying this is not practical. These are assumed. I have to write the equations for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are all equal nodal distances. So for node 1, I have to write equation 34, 4v1. So for node 1, it becomes 4v3. Then v2 means 100. 
and v4 means v2 so you can see at the bottom this is v1 similarly v2 it becomes 4 v4 that's no node 1 then v1 then 10 and similarly for v3 v4 and interestingly for node 3 and 4 this radial distance is h so r is equal to s into h so s is equal to 1 for node 5 and 6, the radial distance is 2h. So radial distance 2h means s is equal to 2. So for 5 and 6, we take s is equal to 2. So here you can see v3 and v4, I write the equation, but s is equal to 1. v5 and c6, I write the equation, but s is equal to 2. This is the way we write the equation. So I stop here because you said that uh, you have another class at 12 o'clock today. So I have some one or two minutes if you have any questions. Of course, the notes you will get. But any questions? Sir, in nodal distance of unequal length, we have to take the highest, largest distance between the nodes, then it has to be a uh, Distance between the grid or we can take tan diagonal distances also. No, 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 not distance. Internodal distance, right? Diagonal distance is never the internodal distance. It is always you take two nodes and take the distance between them. But uh, oh sorry, I should reframe my statement. Not only internodal distance, the nodes which are connected. Diagonal nodes are not connected. No? Okay, sir. Any other question? Sir, uh, can you give an example of a system that is uh, not axisymmetric? Mm, oh, there are n number of uh, this thing. Uh, okay, next class I will show, I will give you a clear one. Right? Today you have a some shortage of time. I okay, think to, uh, we are having a class on Friday. So Friday I will give you. I will show you. Okay, sir. And I I will also show you another interesting one that can you imagine something as single dimensional? No. Think about it. For two days, think about it. Then I will show you. Okay. Sir. Single di single dimensional field, which means field varying with one coordinate only. Think about it. And then I will show you. Okay, any other question? No, then I think you can log out. Thank you. Join on Friday. Thank you, sir.